Right, so that's half seven, so I'm going to make a start. So good evening and welcome everyone. Tonight we're going to get a presentation from Peter Wiltshire. Peter's um, presentation revolves around the theme of achieving a balance between heritage and growth. Now the background to Peter's presentation is that last year, um, Lancaster Civic Vision participated in a study which was being promoted by um, Civic Voice, which had been funded by central government. And basically, cut a long story short, we, we ended up as one of the case studies that involved us in submitting quite a lot of information and views and face-to-face -to -face meetings. Thereafter, um, the organisers of the project produced a report and we were one of, gave it, I think maybe five, was it six case studies? I can't remember the name of the Twelve. Was it twelve, right? Twelve yeah. and twelve case studies, yeah. yeah. So basically we were one of the, the, the 12 case studies. And what they did was they tried to sort of um, draw out some themes from the various case studies. Now, we, we've got a, a, a meeting coming up um, a few weeks time with the guys from Civic Voice to talk about this, right? And it's gonna be a meeting that David will be publicizing um, in the story. Um, but we will send out all the members' details. So I'm going to stop at that point. And Peter is going to talk probably for about 20 minutes or so. We'll then have an opportunity for questions. Um, and then we'll try and make some sense to see whether we, we've got a, a, a consensus view on the issue and whether we've got a, a single voice. So, Peter, over to you. All right, thank you. Good evening, everybody. As uh, uh, as has been explained to you, there was this study. The principal drivers of it were the Historic Towns and Villages Forum. They're based in Hall in Oxford. Just before you stop, can I ask everybody, gone wrong. Can I ask everybody to go on mute because we're having sound from. So we go on mute until we get to the questions. Okay, I've muted him. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Can you, can you all hear me okay? Good. Glad to hear it. You, you'll be sorry, you'll be, you'll be muting me in a minute. Um, yeah, as I was saying, the uh, Historic Towns and Villages Forum, they're based in a place called Kellogg Hall in, in, in Oxford. So I guess they're not too flaky. Um, and, the, <laughs> and the awkwardly named Alliance of Historic Cathedral Cities and Towns, and Historic England. Uh, the initial 84-page report was published in July 2022, 20, and I've read through it. There's an awful lot of detail in it. Uh, so later on, I'm going to just pick out certain points because the study was very in-depth. There are 12, 12 councils, 12 cities involved, and in each city there was the, the local authority was consulted, the civic societies were consulted, and the councillors were. And they've all had input into this very wordy report, which is a bit heavy going. However, as we'll see later on, uh, I've picked out the meat of it, as I think. Um, there was a foreword to the report by the splendidly named Ptolemy Dean, who's the chairman of the Canterbury Society, and he said that society needs more care than to simply allow developers to build what they want, where they want, around the edges of historic cities and towns. And that the solution does not lie within the weakening and dismantling of the planning system. This is, these are concerns we've had in our society for a long time. We've seen the, uh, the planning system get weaker and weaker and developments that we're not happy with appearing all over the place. But first, before we get into local issues and before we get into the report itself, I'd like to just take you on a little journey um, to share with you some of the thoughts I have on when the world of heritage and the world of development collide. Mm. And I'm going to take you right across the world to 
somewhere else when I get the slideshow up, which should appear any second. Ah, can you see that? Mm. Right. Um, toward the, the study is called Towards a Better Balance Between Heritage and Growth. And we, I'm going to, when I get to my, it's not responding. Yes, it is. Here we go. I'm going to take you on a journey halfway around the world to a totally different culture, to a city state that has seen phenomenal growth over the last 40 or so years. In the 1970s, newly independent Singapore, governed by Lee Kuan Yew, was very keen to sweep away all traces of its colonial past and to replace it with stunning modern architecture. It was Lee Kuan Yew's vision to have the greenest and cleanest city in Southeast Asia. And to a great extent, um, that was true. But there was a tsunami of bulldozers just marching across the island, uh, plowing everything into the ground. And then about 1980, somebody woke up to the fact that there was heritage and it was when Raffles Hotel, that iconic symbol of Singapore, was threatened with demolition, that people started chaining themselves to the walls and stand laying down in front of the bulldozers and saying, no, we can't do this. We've got a lot of heritage to offer. And the government did a complete about face. And now when you go to Singapore, you can see items like this. This was the old general post office under the British colonial rule. <laughs> It's now a very nice hotel. It's called the Fullerton Hotel. And now heritage has become a great income for Singapore. That their heritage tourism is a major part of their economy. As it could be in ours, I think, on a much lesser scale, if we had the planning powers to preserve our heritage properly and the funding to look after it, both of which we don't seem to have. That's St Andrew's Cathedral in, in Singapore. Again, it was threatened, it was falling to bits. Now it's a superb building. I don't know what that little modernist annex on the side of it's doing there, but maybe we can worry about that another time. One thing they've become quite good at in Singapore is something that we sneer at a little bit and it's the word, yeah, I don't think it's really a word, and if Hugh Roberts is looking, or listening to me, he'll squirm at this, that, that facadism, this um, concept of sticking a modern building between, behind a historic facade, they've done a bit of that. And facadism, I, in my opinion, sometimes works, um, and sometimes it doesn't. But I also think that Singapore, with its absolutely fabulous modern architecture of so, is of such good quality that they're creating heritage for the future. So I think when we talk about heritage, we don't talk just about the old buildings we've got. We have to think about the new ones that we're creating and will they be the heritage buildings of the future? I would like to think so. This is a facade. This is the former Argyle Car Works just outside Glasgow. Some of you may know it. Um, you wouldn't know it, but behind that rather heavy handed and stodgy Edwardian facade is a 1990s shopping mall. But it was felt that we should keep the, or that the authorities there should keep the facade, which they have. And I think that works rather well. It works well, facadism, to use that horrible word, it works well sometimes. And then there are other times. And here we have this alien monster hatching from this sort of 1930s modernist stonework uh, designed by our city engineer, Frederick Hill at the time. I think on its own, that modern building would probably look okay. But here it just appears to be crawling out of the ruins of the former bus garage. And I don't know, it just seems strangely ridiculous. At the other end of this block, 
we have a little supermarket hiding behind the the facade of the Kingsway Baths, and I think that works. But at this end, goodness knows, I think that building would have been better on its own. And don't worry about the bus garage. But that's just my view. You'll have your own views on that. So back to the report. This was the report in July 2022. And as, as I've mentioned, the um, city councils, local authorities, civic societies and councillors came up with their own kind of things. Now, the, common, the most common uh, concerns from civic societies were these. Number one was funding, the damaging effects of cuts in funding to local authorities resources the reduction in the numbers of staff working in conservation departments and the hiring of less qualified and less experienced staff physical character constraints that is the importance of taking into account geographical environmental and spatial con constraints which could limit the land available think think of singapore there they haven't got any land they just build upwards and natural character, that's the importance of natural heritage, open spaces, waterways, and the need to protect and enhance those areas. And there was this perceived lack of control that planners have to limit and steer new developments. And this has led to a feeling that developers can ignore issues such as traffic problems and can fail to build carbon to carbon neutral standards. Throughout the country, throughout the 12 areas consulted, it was considered that there was a lack of provision for cycling and walking, both currently and in future plans. The challenge of air pollution and levels of pollutants which threaten health didn't seem to be being addressed. Plus, views of historic places were being threatened by developments which interrupted the skyline. And it was also stated that there seemed to be a lack of interest in heritage amongst elect, elected members and that there should be some need for training in heritage and design. And of course, of the other one, the one that we talk about quite a lot when considering housing developments is affordability, the cost of housing and the need for housing for rent maybe social housing, which local people can afford. Because at the moment, what seems to be happening is that developers are building what they want to build, what makes them the most money, without regard to local needs and local demands. So, recommendations. Uh, and in these recommendations, ignore the would lay out of this slide the rest of them are no better um, the principal actors it is felt in recommendations should be national government through adjustments to the planning systems historic Eng England and local authorities plus civic societies as key voluntary groups this is what the report found and in national government it was felt that housing targets which are allocated to local authorities should be better informed by the local issues of each district. In some cases they suggest, and I'm not sure that everybody here would agree with that, in some cases adjusting boundaries to better plan growth around historic cities and towns. In other words, if you make the boundary of the area bigger you're taking the development a bit further away from the heritage. I'm not sure if that works. You'll all have your own views. Uh, and to embed a much stronger mechanism for land value capture in the planning system and ensure that the benefits of the development are felt locally. In other words, to meet local needs and demands, as, as we said. And to give better confidence in the role of neighbourhood plans. There's also a recommendation to remove VAT on building refurbishment. 
Um, at the moment, you can reclaim all the VAT for a new development, but you really struggle to get any VAT back for a refurbishment. And as VAT is currently 20%, that is significant when you're considering whether to refurbish a building or demolish it. Um, so I can absolutely see where they're coming from on that one. And for Historic England, they are suggesting that they provide more guidance and support to local authorities and to publicise training for councillors and officers on heritage and development. To update and reissue heritage count studies on the economic value of heritage. And I think I've read somewhere in some of the notes here that heritage tourism brought in 18.4 billion pounds billion in, 19, in 2019 just before covid so heritage tourism is, is significant it's a, it's a major part of our economy so we, we ignore it at our peril and it is also suggested that historic england provide a library or resource for local authorities of best practice both on heritage and sustainability of historic buildings and their, you know, their, their sustainable use. And as far as local authorities go, it, they are saying that all councillors should, I, I guess whether they're on a planning committee or not, should receive regular training on the heritage and design to make sure that they understand how to maintain and enhance the character of historic places and promote greater understanding of an emphasis on heritage through the production of a heritage strategy with a clear delivery plan and recommended actions. As I say, these are the recommendations and that they, those in themselves are quite wordy. But if I cut them any more, I'll, uh, I'll lose the, the context. So I'm sorry if this is sending you to sleep. Um, it was also recommended that planning committees represent the full range of places within the local authority area so that decisions are placed about historic place are made by representatives for the benefit of those towns and cities. Uh, support heritage and design forums, such as the ones that committed uh, that, that um, drove this report. Um, they, they can play a valuable role in, in, in protecting heritage and to encourage, and this is where we come in, civic societies and other community groups to engage with their local authority on heritage and growth at all stages. I, I, I think we do that as best we can at the moment. Clearly, we're not always effective, but I, we do get, as you know, very involved with them on planning matters. Civic societies, it is said, should develop closer relationships with elected council members and heritage design officers in order to work collaboratively in protecting heritage and fostering good design. We try to do that. And to support local authorities in encouraging greater invo involvement in planning consultation with local people, especially among harder to reach and more diverse groups in the community. Perhaps that's something we can look at developing. Uh, we do our best to support the local authority. <coughs> a particular issue, maybe something we can look at. And we can bring, it is recommended, local experts to the attention of planning, heritage and design officers and councillors so that they can make a positive and informed contribution. Now, Planning officers don't tend to be local people in many cases. Conservation officers don't, they tend to come from somewhere else. So here's where we can possibly work with them and bring their local knowledge up to date. They, we can't expect them to know everything about our area, but between us, as a civic society, we probably know a fair bit. So I think we probably have a role here I think that particular point is very valid. And so it's coming up to discussion time. I should have mentioned that 
in these recommendations, there was something regarding national government, which I felt was missing. And uh, I'll give a prize. I don't know what yet. It won't be a very valuable prize to the person who comes up with what they think is the missing item in those government recommendations. Uh, just make, I should have mentioned that at first, just to keep you awake. Right, it's now time to uh, perhaps for everybody to have their say. Peter, can you take the presentation down? Excellent. Okay, excellent presentation, Peter. Lots of food for thought. So I'm looking for observations or questions. Who wants to go first? If you could raise your hand, that'd be great, either virtually or real. You've oh, stunned well, their silence here, Peter. <laughs> they're, they're all asleep. When, when I speak, it's like a mogadon. They all, they all... <laughs> okay, well, let, let, let me stir things up a bit, right? Um, I mean, clearly your, um, your, the title of your presentation, the title of the study was about the, the balance between the heritage and growth, yeah? Yeah. Um, but during the presentation, Peter, you made specific reference to the lack of low cost housing, right, you know, for people. And the fact that many people are now formally excluded from the housing market. Now, whether we like it or not, there's actually a direct correlation between the amount of building that goes on and the price of the housing. And one of the things that actually has inflated house prices over the last 15 or 20 years has been a lack of supply. House builders love it because it means their land banks are worth a lot of money and they make a lot of profit. But the people, and, and the people who have also won out of this are people like me that have had a mortgage for a long time and sitting on you know, a lot of equity. But the big, big losers are younger people. And if you look at what a house costs now um, for somebody, you're trying to buy the photo compared to what houses were when I was looking at my own house. And I know it's been inflation, but if you look at it as multiples of income, it's really, really smart. So one of the things we've just got to be conscious of is that sometimes the protection of heritage right, has got unintended consequences. And I think there's a, an issue here about you know, how society functions, because at the end of the day, we want to make sure that whatever we do benefits all the citizens. So does anybody have a view on that? Feel happy to disagree because I've got no monopoly of wisdom. The title of the of this presentation was uh, towards a better balance between heritage <clears throat> and growth. And I think in the, the authors of it, I think we're aware that there is a huge demand for housing. I think in if I've got these figures right, I think the government predicted in 2021 that there was a need for 300,000 houses a year in the UK, a new new houses. And we delivered, I think, 234 in the same year. Yeah. Um, so there's a shortfall. I think the problem is, uh, as I mentioned before, that we're not really solving a housing crisis by doing this. We're, we're building what developers need to build to satisfy their shareholders, uh, rather than um, looking at social needs particularly, because obviously there's less money in that. Oh, we've now got some hands up, great. Well, I'm, going to, I'm going to take Amy first and then I'll take Ian. Thanks, James. You certainly sparked some debate there with your comments. Um, I think for me, I, yeah, in terms of the recommendations of the report, well, you know, that I'm fine, that, you know, they seem to make a lot of sense. And as far as, you know, the responsibility of civic societies, I think we would, you know, I would certainly sign on to that. And I'm sure many of my colleagues would as well. I think the challenge that we've got is, you know, sort of building on what James was saying around the wider political dimension, because certainly at the moment, although they've rode, ridden back from some of their more, I should say, interesting proposals, we have, a, you know, the, the prevailing consensus at government is to deregulate and liberalise and free up potential for development. And maybe I'm misconstruing it, but I see that as potentially bringing 
conflict with heritage interests, preservation and development of heritage. And you know, the, the economic factors which have just been mentioned play into that because the more expensive you make it, the less is likely to be built. So I think there's an inherent conflict there. And whilst you know, we might have a change of government in a, in a couple of years time, again, I, c I can only see there being pressure for all the reasons James has described to extend housing provision and create more conflict. So I think we're in a bit of a bind, you know, in terms of the way national politics is heading. Mm -hmm. And although we can certainly develop our practice and be more effective influencers, I think we're always going to struggle against that political dimension. So that's not a very positive comment, but that for me is how I see it. Yes. I think, I think I'm going to bring Ian in a second, but if I can just comment on what you just said, Amy, because I think it's a realistic perspective. The one point of issue we take with you that where is the government generally have gone on a liberalisation agenda? In terms of housing, they bottled out of it because they were going to come forward with some pretty stringent sort of uh, powers to make local authorities run house were built. One of the big tensions nationally in politics is the, the British Shire counties, people hate new housing, right? They really hate new housing because they've got the house. And it's, it's interesting that people are saying about the, excuse me, I'm still getting over a cold. Um, it's interesting what people are saying about the numbers. I spent a good part of my life working as a planner. And one of the things that struck me was that people don't really listen to numbers. It doesn't really impact them, right? Where it does impact them is when they suddenly realise that their children can't buy a house. You know, they've got a child, and the child wants to live near their parents, and they've got no chance because they're priced out in the market. And I, I, I always remember once going to a dinner where I was in a table with a guy called Steve Morgan, who runs Red Row Homes. And he was saying to me that his problem was that his customer of today is his objective of tomorrow. So people buy a house in phase one and then they're objective. Phase two. So I think you're right, Amy, that was a, a big national debate, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't take a view on it, on it locally. Ian, I'm going to bring you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, Peter, thank you very much for the presentation. Don't worry about sending me to sleep. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to multitask and analyse statistics at the same time as I'm listening to you. So, basically, <laughs> so hence, that's why my camera's off. Um, just a number of observations, really. Um, uh, first of all, uh, observation question, how effective will this report will be? Because I was listening to your talk and it, it wasn't your talk as such, but my heart sank when I heard yet more initiatives and yet more strategies. And I wonder how many initiatives and strategies get you know, written and just binned, basically. And that was quite uh, kind of quite, quite a depressing thought. Um, I'm not overly confident the national government would do anything. Any government that can um, rip up ancient woodland to put a railway line through it uh, is no longer conservative, is it? It's not interested in preserving anything anymore. It's, it's gone beyond that. It is an ideological uh, <coughs> outfit. At the same time, though, just picking up the whole kind of um, uh, debate around housing, I, I think if we talk in the terms in which we're talking, we're buying into a settled narrative. And I want to disagree with the narrative. Uh, the narrative tends to be unconsciously that if you preserve heritage, uh, you limit housing or limit progress. And places of heritage tend to be places people want to live and therefore have high, pri high prices. So it's associated with culture. Um, my line of argument would be the opposite of that. So my mum, for example, will tell you about my granddad keeping his horse on the weir in the River Loon because he was a potter. He was, he was, he was a North Lancashire kind of, um, you know, gypsy, and that, that's where he did it. And she can tell me all about Main Street and all about that area of Morecambe and, and tons of stuff that these days you've got to research in a museum. And I just think the line to sell for social housing, which is why I'm glad to see the press releases and the civic uh, vision about, about social housing in, in the Canal Quarter is, if we don't be, build decent social housing, we're robbing people of their heritage because they've got as much right to that heritage as anybody else. You see what I mean? So actually, we buy into the playoff, the argument that heritage and progress have somehow got to negotiate. I don't think that's true. I think what we've got to say that good heritage is good progress because you give people their heritage back and restore it to them, really. Um, and I think that's the line of argument to take. Uh, I am extremely interested in your comment about um, uh how much um, uh, money um, uh, you know, is brought in by heritage. You know, I've long thought that Lancaster is a, an undersold 
the city in terms of that respect really that you know it it seems to me that it's an ideal kind of uh, two-day break city especially with the way the castle's been up and there's other kind of possibilities for that but that's just a throwaway comment at the end thank you okay th thanks for that Ian I mean I mean I'll, I'll give a view on how likely this is going to be in terms of impact and I'll ask Peter to give his view but in my view not likely um, I think it's well intentioned I think there is some good stuff in there but I'd, I struggle to see how some of it would be, would, be, would be implemented at the best of times. At the moment, we've got a government on life support, right? You know, you know whatever your political you know, views. Um, and Amy said, you're in an election in two years' time. Personally, uh, I'm... Jamie, wondering... sorry to interrupt. I often attend withdrawal of treatment for patients. Would you like me to do that for the government? I can do it quite happily. It's not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can I, I can get the proposed HS2 link down to Westminster quick as anything. It's not about this. <laughs> and, and as I say, I'm, I wonder whether we'll make this year. But the point I'm really making seriously is that if you look at the pickle they're in, this isn't going to be high up the agenda. And I particularly I say that because I thought it was really interesting that both Sunak and Stammer made major speeches over the last few days, right? And neither of those pictures did either of them mention housing. Now, if I were a national politician and I was trying to get, I was trying to win a general election, I would actually make housing a huge issue because there are huge numbers of young people out there who have been exited from the housing market that older people were able to enjoy. So for all those reasons, Ian, I, I don't have a lot of confidence this is going to do very much. But Peter, you may take a different view. No, I, I, I agree entirely. I, I do think that we're a victim of a kind of success it, that started in the 80s, which was the right to buy. And the right to buy, interestingly, worked very well in Singapore, which we talked about earlier. Sorry to keep mentioning Singapore. But Margaret Thatcher's right to buy policy was based on the Housing Development Board in Singapore. I don't know if you know that, where there was a massive need for housing, for housing that people could afford. And the government didn't want to be always owning all this housing stock, so they gave them the right to buy. It works very well in Singapore, but what's happened here is there's now no incentive for local authorities to build houses, knowing that they're going to have to sell them at a loss in a few years' time. So, yeah, sorry. But Peter, it's worse than that, because I can remember from right to buy was introduced, right? I was a young local government officer at the time. And the original legislation, the original proposal was the funds that were generated by the sales would be reinvested in new housing. Mm. And the Treasury put their foot down and said, no, 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 we want that money. So that's why we ended up with a situation where the supply of social housing diminished so radically. If they would reinvested the money they had made, it would not have had nearly as dramatic an impact as it has had. Yes, and, and I guess that's why Singapore's system works and ours doesn't, because theirs is reinvested. Yeah. You know, the, the housing development boards are, are very powerful bodies. Um, on, there, might said, a, sorry, there might be a wider point than that, um, mm -hmm. uh, Jamie, and, and Peter as well. Um, we. As part of um, producing our newsletter, the Health Festival, I've, I've been doing, I could put my geek head on and going back to a former life and doing some statistical analysis. And we're looking at debt and I sit on a, um, a financial support group for the trust as well for its staff. Um, debt in the UK took off in 1980 precisely you can measure it and, the, and we're not just talking about a changing housing we're talking about a changing culture so the right to buy was part of a wider changing culture that saw the profit motive be the dominant motive for all of life basically and and consumption be the dominant mode of all life so you can see that it's, it's almost it's a flat line basically for 100 odd years in terms of both personal and corporate debt as soon as you get to 1980s it just goes through the roof and even when it collapses and you have problems it never gets anywhere near the pre-1980 level so it, 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 it there is there is a deeper issue, I think, really. And that's why, you know, I was trying to say before that we need to somehow not play the narrative that's there, but try and find a different narrative. But, yeah, that's, that's, how, chap that's how chaplains think, sorry. But I, it, it, I mean, I agree with that. But the only sort of agency we have is at local level. We can't really influence the national position, except we go out and vote in a general election once every however many years it might be. And what we've been doing, been like aesthetic visions, we have been really pushing 
the City Council on the issue of social housing. And our view is that they have not been nearly radical enough. There are opportunities available to them. There are things they could do, but they, they, for whatever reason, they just want to do. And that was why we put out the press release we did that you referred to, <clears throat> because they wanted, you know, good news, we're going to build some houses in the Canal Quarter, but it's market housing. Um, what about the people that can't afford market housing? And there are a lot of them. If you read, if you read the council's own home strategy, you know, you'd be surprised because uh, everybody thinks this is only a problem in the in the, the bigger cities in the south. It's not the problem in the north as well. There are very yeah. different elements of the like of the population can't afford it. Right, Ian, you can do me a favour. Sorry, I'll take it down. It's it's what they call a, a heritage hand. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> and then I'll, I'll put it back up. So, anybody else want to make an observation or comment? Right, I'm going to stir the pot again. Peter, Peter was talking about. Um, the fact that in Singapore, they knocked down lots of their buildings and then suddenly stopped. I mean, a, a similar thing actually happened in this country, because if you look, if you look at what happened in the major cities in the 50s and the 60s, lots of brilliant buildings were demolished. So the one that comes to mind is Houston Station, the original building, where the frontage of the columns room ended up, I think, in the river. Um, and there's lots of other examples. But there was, there, was, there was a change to that. But the, po the point I wanted to come on to was, Peter was talking about listed buildings. Um, and I mean, it's quite interesting. One of the listed buildings in Lancaster District is Lancaster Services. So you know, what, what, you know, what's people's reaction to Lancaster Services as a listed building? Because it's not what I think most people would characterize as their typical, somebody says you're a listed building, you wouldn't automatically think of Lancaster services? No. It's, it's unusual and it, um, it's part of that brave new world of the 60s, isn't it? It's symbolic of the culture at yeah. the time. So I think it's got some, or should we say, some local cultural interest rather than particularly um, architectural merit. I think that's where it's why it's listed probably you sometimes get buildings that are listed not because of what they are but because of their associations and you think of john lennon's house in liverpool and you know it's just a semi but it's listed because it was where john lennon grew up and so with fort and services perhaps the argument could be made i'm not saying it should that it was very typical of the the sort of yeah brave new you know horizons that were looked forward to in the 60s um and it's symbolic of that perhaps i can i can see well, you I, I, no, I, I agree Jill, you'd like to come in i think you're on mute Jill, still sorry about that just about fortin services yeah. So I came from down that neck of the woods. I was born in 1969, so I guess the motorway was still fairly new when I was a, a child, and we used to get on at Junction 33 and travel to Blackpool a lot and, and call up Fortin Services for food and whiz up and down in the lift, and so it was sort of part of my growing up, whereas now, generationally, I've moved on. I've got young children, young teenage children, and they go, well, what's that? What's that thing, Mum? And I was like, wait, so like we used to watch something called Star Trek. It looks like a spaceship, doesn't it? And well, what, what, what's it for? I said, well, there's a restaurant on the top. Can we go up? No, you can't go up there anymore because it's it's defunct and the concrete's got cracks in it. And well, why don't they knock it down? Well, it's listed, so they can't knock it down. Well, why not? Why is it listed? So we go through this conversation and. Uh, they actually find it really fascinating so that you actually then talk about this modern history in the 60s and how groundbreaking yeah. it was for the M6 to be built and how quiet it was in grandfather's day and and now we're surrounded with traffic and when you explain to your children you actually realize that this is part of our modern history um whether it's right or wrong that that building is preserved it's on a on a, on a flat plane at the edge of the pennines it does really really stand out and as a child, I was fascinated by that building and all the bridges, the different style of all the bridges on that stretch of the motorway. I found the architecture absolutely fascinating. So, it, but it's just so funny how you relate it to your own childhood and then your children see it in a completely different way. It's like some old defunct thing to them. 
Absolutely. Um, yeah. I think it says a warning to say if you don't book your ideas up, look what happens. Basically, that's it. It's just. <laughs> but I also, I also think, Jill, that what 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 people fail to appreciate is just the excitement there was in the sixties and seventies about the brave new world that was emerging. Yeah, and and also that that stretch of the motorway. I don't think it still is, but it was the longest um, stretch between get-offs between 32 and 33, which was on the M6, I believe, when it was built. So that was another, you know, kind of like record. Um, so, yeah, yeah, fascinating stuff. But it's not David, the kind of architecture that I'm interested in, really. I, I quite like it, to be honest, right? But, David, yeah, bring you in. Yeah, uh, just a, a couple of points. Ian mentioned about skirting, and, and, uh, and it'll follow on a little bit on what Julia said. Um, I've been lucky enough over the last few months to work with a lady called Jean Birtwistle, who was the headmistress, or she was a teacher, sorry, at uh, Skirton Junior School. And she created a book called uh, Skirton in Times Past, which is all about the Skirton area that Ian was talking about prior to the demolition in the uh, early 60s and the, the new buildings, the new bright Future that was built there of the flats and, and uh, main, main Street it is now and uh, all that area. Um, it's absolutely fascinating. In fact, uh, Ian, I'll send you uh, a, a link to the book. Thank you. I, I know you'll enjoy. Uh, but then, then Jill's mentioned, uh, you know, what her children are saying about the uh, uh, the Fortin services, and uh, you know, uh, that's now iconic in there. And the irony of all this is that um, the brave new world that was built in Skirton in the 60s and the way we were going to be is now about to be knocked down. And, of course, there's going to be new buildings there because now they're, they're defunct. So they are actually heritage now because we're, we're going to lose them shortly. Uh, uh, so, you know, much as we perhaps, you know, people of my ilk, you know, despise them, and, uh, and enjoy looking at these past pictures of, of the original skirt and people say, why was it pulled down? I fear that in a few years' time, people are actually going to turn around and say, why is the current skirt being pulled down? Yeah. Do you want to come back in? Yeah, uh, it's very interesting. I grew up in skirt and I know its unique character. It, it, it is an absolutely fascinating village. It, really a lot of its population came about from the fact that it was on the cattle droving route from Scotland to yeah. uh, to the Midlands and that brought the itinerant population in uh, with their unique culture um, but yeah I mean the, the, I think we have an argument with the flats at Skirton to say that they were built of wimpy no finds concrete which was uh, a high-tech solution in 1959 which any of you who know about system building will probably realize that wimpy no finds wasn't a very good way to build anything. Uh, so if anything, the buildings themselves are substandard. And if we can't uh, find a reason to make them a heritage asset, uh, which I'd be very surprised at, then probably they really should come down because they're not <laughs> buildings at all. But, but what is interesting, what isn't generally appreciated um, Peter, is that during the 50s, 60s and 70s, a lot of the buildings and the construction methods that have been seen as problematic, non-traditional construction methods, high rise, etc. Central government incentivized local authorities to use those methods by giving them a higher degree of grant if they actually did that. Right now, you know, you, you might have all sorts of views about what their motives were in doing that. But actually, you know, local authorities didn't wake up one morning and say, oh, we're going to do all the new things. You know, there was, yeah. there was, a, there was an incentive to do it. And, and that's been lost. Out. And we've got, I think, it's David or Pam, I'm not sure which. And we've I think, got. You're on, you're on mute. I can see Pam and David Jones's hands been up for yeah. quite some time. Yeah, it's OK, it's David. Um, David. Just the general, <laughs> we had the wonderful opportunity um, sort of over the new year to spend uh, three days in Edinburgh. And I think Edinburgh is a wonderful 
example of really the heart of what you're partly talking about from the old town and the new town. And you actually see now, obviously, the old town is really old and the new town is mostly now approaching 150, 200 years old. And then you go to, as we had the opportunity just before we come back, to go to Holyrood Palace. And you've actually got there, again, different levels of heritage with different times of the royal family. So my point is really that whatever is built now or what was built 50, 60 years ago or 100 years ago, it eventually does become heritage. Yeah. Because the, yeah. the, issue, the big issue is that obviously that some of the stuff that was built in the early 60s, like you could say something, <clears throat> Lancaster Police Station or Morecambe Police Station, I think was a, the abomination from wherever, concrete abomination, that completely don't fit in with the area of Lancaster where they're built. But they're there, aren't they? And so it's yeah. just a general point, really. Yeah. I've got a question, David, and then I've got loads of it. My question is, when you were in Edinburgh, did you go to the Scottish Parliament building? And if so, what did you think of that? We didn't. We, we actually went past it. And yeah. because it is virtually across the road from Hollywood yeah. Palace. Yeah. And, uh, and it's in one sense, it's not that in keeping, but it's it's not in keeping with obviously Hollywood. But I suppose the area around that area, it's not uh, too terrible, I suppose. I, I actually think it works quite well, but my observation um, related to what you were saying about um, buildings that were built and were vilified at the time. And one of the interesting things that I discovered was that Liverpool Waterfront, the Three Graces, the Port of Liverpool building, the Canard building, and the Liver building, those three buildings were erected right at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. And they're now, they're now lauded as one of the architectural gems of the Western world. And at the time they were built, there was outrage. People hated them, you know? The, 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 the city council at the time was destroying the city. So, you know, th this, this question of people being outraged by something, this issue of people being outraged by something, then over time, people actually warming to them. It, it, it does happen a lot, so you make a very good point. Ian, do you want to come back in again? Just, yeah, if possible, please. Thank you. I mean, just a question to which I don't know the answer. Um, uh, what's the difference between heritage and sentimentality? Uh -huh. Because, you know, it's a, a person that I think a lot of the houses on Main Street that were, were knocked down, <laughs> there was heritage value. To be honest, you can take those flats down tomorrow for me. And the same for same for the big orange nasty yeah. thing on top of the uh, old bus station, really. But yeah, it, it, I know the taste changes and so forth, but there's something important because if you say everything becomes heritage you've got to preserve everything or if or you go to the opposite extreme in the 60s and say well we don't believe in that we believe in something new so we'll knock the whole lot down so there's got to be a balance somehow isn't there i don't know so yeah i mean i i think you make a good point um i mean i, I i'm always very interested in the word conservation because some people believe that word conservation means everything gets preserved and nobody can touch it and I, i'm not in that school of thought at all because I actually think there's lots of examples where older buildings have been successfully uprated and modernised. And one of, one of the big issues is actually finding viable uses for older buildings. So, for instance, St John's Church, um, we've all struggled for years to try and find a future for St John's Church. It's listed, that sort of um, limits the number of things you can do with it. Is not particularly conducive to modern. Fortunately, I think we've, we've now got some sort of hope that we're, we're going to find a way around that. But the other point I would make is that just because a building doesn't necessarily mean it's any good, because there are lots yeah. of beautiful buildings you know, built over the, the last two or three centuries. So I don't know, Peter, if you want to go at yeah. any I, I just wanted to make some points about the heritage that, as I understand it, and that the criteria, I think, for listing something as a historic uh, building or a heritage asset was it either had to be of cultural or historic significance 
like John Lennon's house or have some special architectural merit. And presumably the flats on Mainway that we talked about a little while ago probably don't have any special architectural merit. Now in West London, as you come out of Paddington Station and look north, there's a great big tower. It's two towers joined together by links on every other level. It's called Trellick Tower. Uh, that was built about the same time as the flats on Mainway, uh, designed by an architect with a splendid name of Erno Goldfinger. Now that's a listed building because it's quite stunning. It stands out, it's unique, just like Fortin Services. It, it's, it's of special cultural and historic significance. Plus, it's very unusual architecture. So I think that's why uh, it, it, it is hard to define heritage and it changes because sometimes buildings which are quite ordinary are dignified by their age. Other times, um, you know, you, you'd sometimes wonder why buildings are listed. But by and large, I think there are fair, fairly clear guidelines about what heritage is or isn't. Okay, thanks for that, Peter. So we've got Alison wanting to come in next. And you, you right, we, we've had a discussion about the cultural sort of heritage of 1960s and thereabouts. And I, I think the most significant part, as far as Lancaster is concerned, cultural heritage of 1960s is the founding of the University of Lancaster and yep. what was then St. Martin's College, both in 1964. Yeah. And those two institutions at that time. Um, the way for heating an area like that was to do it with uh, with oil and have a huge chimney that disposed the uh, dispersed the pollutants up into the atmosphere. And if you've got a big chimney, you might as well wrap a few student residences around it. So we have Boland <coughs> Tower at uh, University of Lancaster and uh, what's the William Thompson Hall of Residence at uh, St Martin's. Um, my knowledge and Hughes is more of St Martin's than university, but. But there we have buildings of sort of cultural importance that way. Each have expanded the University of Lancaster in a much greater way with uh, various qualities of architecture in the buildings that have gone up since. And similarly, St. Martin's, there's a very noticeable John Centimore Lecture Theatre at St. Martin's, which is really quite a, quite a masterpiece. But apart from those, there's then the knock-on effect, which we started discussing which is that of the, the, the impact of uh, the University in St. Martins or University of Cumbria um, on the housing situation, <clears> where <throat> all the small starter houses on Primrose and uh, Moorlands and so on, are almost all <laughs> taken over as student housing. Any empty building in the central Lancaster that can possibly be converted into use for student housing, um, that's done so. And we have new buildings as well. So somewhere along this line, the people, the non-university folk of, 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 of Lancaster are losing out in that housing stock in a very big way. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's a really good point. And it's something that Lancaster Civic Business have pointed to out to the council on a number of occasions. I mean, first of all, on the traditional terrace stock, which has become student housing, that's two impacts. One, it pushed property prices up, because buy-to-let landlords are into the market, that's inflated prices. But it's also inflated rental values, yeah? So people have lost their lot. And the point you make about spec build, spec built student housing, um, up until very recently, Lots of people who were wanting to do office developments and other things to create employment just could not compete with the amount of money that the people wanting to build the student accommodation could put down on the table. So you're absolutely right that it has distorted the housing market in Lancaster quite significantly. And that's one of the reasons that we feel so strongly about the whole issue of social and affordable housing, because we need to do something to compensate that, to try and make sure that younger people have a better sort of opportunity in the housing that we currently have. Jill, you want to come in again? Yeah, thank you. Just following on from that point about the university and the 
uh, the, well, the, how it's grown over the years as well. So that's further impacted the situation with the city. And I didn't, I've not really looked at the statistics as to the number of students and how many are accommodated on campus and in the city until I read the um, council's topic papers last week or, or most of them. I didn't quite get through them all. But um, so I, I'm afraid I responded. You sort of put all this stuff together and uh, suddenly it dawns on you how 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 massive the impact and I, I will add that I do think the university is fantastic and education is very important. However, the, the I think they've got just under seven thousand um, heads on campus and and about fifteen thousand students. So therefore, about eight thousand students somewhere in the city. And I don't know the stats on how many are in high rise and how many are in in houses. But obviously, if several thousand heads were removed from the, the little houses on Primrose and wherever they all are in these HMOs, um, that would release, you know, massive housing stock for social housing and other families into the city. And the other point that dawned on me that I thought, oh, I've never really thought about it like that before. So I understand the Bailey Garden Village concept and how people live far more harmoniously in a lovely sort of sprawling not too uh, too many people on top of each other nice little green bits in between and how that that avoids social deprivation um but I thought actually students are probably the only sector of society that live harmoniously and happily stacked up on top of each other in these massive blocks without trying to kill each other really um, Depends how much you've been drinking, Jill. Let's be honest about this. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's perhaps uh, yeah, not, not a very good uh, way of describing. But you know what I mean. It, it, we, we try to move humans away from being too intensive, but actually, students seem to be quite happy to be intensive because that's that's the way they they live on campus generally. It's an interesting point you made um, because you're quite right. <laughs> High density housing actually works well for students. And it doesn't create any sort of social tension. But the other thing we sometimes forget is that outside London, there's very little high density, high amenity housing. But in London, there's lots. There's mm. lots of ways of housing where very affluent people are happy to live on top of each other, as there are in lots of European cities, as I have to say, there is in most Scottish cities as well. So for me, it's not so much about the density, it's mm. about the social conditions of yeah. who are actually living in the density, you know. So, but we, we, could, we could do a PhD thesis in this, Jill, you know, we really could. <laughs> Any, anyone else? Ian, do you want to come back in? Yeah, just I think your comment there and, and Jill's observations actually bring us right back to where we started on the mix in social housing because um, I worked with, uh, when I was training at uh, Durham, uh, one of my fellow students had been in town planning and he, he was saying the major mistake um, that town planners made in the 60s in this country when they were chucking up high rise and tower blocks is that they'd all been off to the south of France to see what people were doing, how they handled their housing. So these fantastic tower blocks. I thought, great, we'll copy it. What they hadn't realised is that everybody in the tower blocks was young. So they, the, the, the planners in France are taking socioeconomic conditions in, 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 into account and basically we're saying, right, we'll put the young people in the flats because it's kind of life they live. The older people are going to stick down here that we, so there's a bit more space on to move around. And, and it, so, so we don't do that. We, we always we seem to look for one size fits all solutions. And it just doesn't work. And I think that does bring us right back to, to the social housing and the need for particularly in the canal quarter is that we need to be saying, well, actually, we want a wee bit of space for the young people around. That's meant to be a vibrant area, but there are some old people who really kind of enjoy being around the vibrancy as well, you know. So what, what's the housing like there? You know, I mean, if it goes well, my parents live in St. Leonard's Gates. I think they quite like the idea of some vibrancy knocking around the canal court and stuff like that. But but those are the questions of conversations that don't seem to take place, I think, really. We just seem to shout at each other, social housing, no social housing, do you know what I mean? High rise, no high rise, that kind of thing, really. And I'll stop now. I've said enough. Thank you. <laughs> I'm really big on in, she's indicating. Um, You're still on mute, Anne. You're still on mute. You need to come yeah, on. Am I? Can you can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Um, uh, unfortunately, I had gremlins in the computer I'm using, so I missed some of Peter's talk. Um, but I will be seeing the recording later. 
What I wanted to say is we've talked tonight a lot naturally about families and younger people and we need more houses. But we mustn't forget that the general population of, of our country is getting older. And many of them, for example, in Slyne with Hess, we've just been having a neighbourhood plan that we've tried to get, get through, but it looks as though, again, that's been stalled because it's green belts. But in, in Slyne, the average age of the people here is around retirement age, and they want to stay living here. So if they want to stay living in the village and they live in a four-bedroom house, where are they going to move to, to allow the younger people to buy that four bedroom family house? So the neighborhood plan tried to, having done a lot of research on what the residents wanted, in many cases is, was two or three bedroom properties on a single floor, with a bit of garden around them, not too crowded and in within the village. So we came up with these, this area and went through all the hoops to do it, having consulted the residents as well. And now, of course, it's Greenbelt and it's been turned down by the planning committee, which is fair enough. OK, OK. So the block, what I'm trying to say is where there's a block from people in our area to move up with their families. Because the older people don't want to go into a home. They want to carry on living on their own, well, not on their own, with their husband, if they're lucky, or wife, or whatever. Um, so that is a, a situation that we have in Slyne with Hest. I mean, I think, I think the point you make is, is a very good one. Um, and I think this is, this is not just Slyne with Hest, but if you look at lots of rural communities, lots of rural communities across the country, you can see exactly the same thing. You've got older people in a big house, but the lights in the area are living in. They'd like to move. There's nowhere in the area for them to move. And again, that's one of the one of the contradictions of course, where we have big arguments about preserving villages and not allowing development around them. But yet, for as long as we can do that, the chances of actually providing alternative types of housing accommodation to allow people in four bedroom houses to downsize without losing the area, I just think I don't think they're going to be realized. So I think you make a very good and strong point. And for me, I think what this whole conversation this evening has done is illustrated that one size doesn't fit all, that there needs to be some sort of fine tuning around this, um, a fine grain. Um, because it's too easy to talk in generalisations. You know, people assume that everybody in villages don't want development. Well, you've just indicated you had a sizable percentage of people who contributed to the neighbourhood plan that did in fact want that, but the conventional wisdom would have argued against that. So good, good point. Any other comments, points anybody wants to make? No, Peter, do you want to, do you want to make any concluding remarks? Um, well, yeah, basically to thank everybody for their patience in letting me ramble on like this. And I, I just hope that it has made people think. Um, me and you have mentioned student, well, a few people have mentioned student housing. It is, there's a lot of things to consider when we consider student housing. The student population make a massive contribution to the local authority, uh, local economy. And I really think that our town centre would be depleted by as much as 30% in the terms of retail outlets if it wasn't for students and university staff. Um, so that, you know, we can't underestimate the value of the university and its students. Uh, I think there are three dynamics when it comes to student accommodation. There are the big institutions who build the large scale developments like Caton Court. There are, and the theory in allowing this to happen is that it will would free up the little houses on Primrose and Moorlands and that we mentioned earlier, which really should be there for young starter families. Um, that hasn't happened in the scale that was anticipated, largely because all the landlords of the little houses tended to just reduce the rent a little bit to compete. 
So instead of paying £140 a week to live in Caton Court, they'll pay £90 a week and, and live on Western Street. Uh, eventually, I think landlords will get fed up and they will market those properties, but nobody wants to sell them cheaply, so they, they're hanging on <coughs> for now. Uh, that might change. The other thing is, uh, when where I see student housing as being beneficial in some areas, is that it's brought into use buildings which wouldn't perhaps have other uses. Uh, the upper parts of shops, um, in particular, were, were and in most towns are, are quite derelict above the ground floor. Uh, in Lancaster, we've got those brought into use in, in many, many cases. And in fact, the rents from the students above are subsidising the shops and keeping and, and allowing landlords to charge us a, a cheaper rent for the ground floor. Now, that's helped to keep our city alive and we can't underestimate the importance of that. Um, so, yeah, those are not really a concluding remark. It was just something I wanted to, to float with you. But thank you, everybody, once again. And Hugh, does the word facadism really exist? If it doesn't, it should. <laughs> <laughs> Thank it you. It does now. <laughs> <laughs> I've just invented it. Oh, well, well, if, well, if we've got cubism and Dadoism and modernism, I don't see where you can't have facadism, to be honest with you. It was, no, it I, was I, snobbery I, not I, to, wouldn't it? So, so. Yeah. <laughs> can, I, can, I, can I be a bit controversial? Because I actually like facadism, right? Because most people, it's a facade of the building at what, at what they notice, right? Yes. I think there's lots and lots of good examples where they've retained the facade of buildings and built behind, and it's worked really well. And most people who don't have an architectural bent probably won't notice that the rest of the building, you know, it is new until they go into it. So, yes. I just so thank you for that. Peter. Anything else you want to add, Peter? Or are you? Not really, except nobody spotted the missing element. Well, tell us, tell us. In the, in the recommendations, which weren't there, they, they, they weren't included. And that is simply more good which won't happen but more government money put into the planning system well it's definitely not going to happen peter yeah you're right yeah. <laughs> no no votes in that mate you know, no because... chance of it <laughs> okay and on, and on that happy note um thank you all for coming along and thank you and we shall see Sorry, before you before you go can i can i just um uh first <laughs> of all uh just uh remind everybody about the next meeting um, and uh, it was very opportune that Artem uh, brought up about the universities because on the 15th of February, uh, we've got Sarah Reese, who's the head of stakeholder relations for Lancaster University. Uh, it'll be on Zoom as well, that one will. Um, she's going to talk about the university's involvement with the city and district, um, uh, the, the future of the uh, city and district. Um, and we've met we've met Sarah before. She came on with Sue Black uh, last year, and she's she's a very very good speaker, uh, uh, involved in an awful lot of things in in the area. So that will be a, a a really good evening, one not to miss. And and I can't miss as well the fact that Jill brought up about the fact of uh, students living harmoniously in these tower blocks. And, and remind everybody of Roger's comment about student prisons. I mean, I couldn't <laughs> miss that one. I could not miss that one. You know, it was, uh, I was waiting for Jill to put the punchline in, but she saved it for me, I'm delighted to say. <laughs> I think, think it sounds lucky Kate and Court is about 30 feet away from my front door. <laughs> oh, no, I think I think David, Amy, did you are you clapping? So David, I think we'll give you the last word on that. Well done. So uh, thank you all. Thank you for coming, and we'll see you again soon. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks, thanks a lot. Good to see you all. Take thank care. You. Safe journey home.